to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Day for the Irish, and I should say top of the morning to all of you, or top of the evening, whichever it happens to be. And um, thank God for the Irish. Our Father loves them dearly, I'm sure, and we're all thankful for it. Don't anyone take that, don't get your tail feathers bent and think I'm being racist today because we Irish are used to people telling jokes on the Irish. And you know something, it has never bothered us one iota. So people need to, people need to relax just a little bit and enjoy their traditions. It's fantastic. Now, our Father's business. Genesis uh, chapter 19, we're going to pick it up here in about t verse 12 for a moment. God is in the process or is just about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And we learned in the last lecture one of the main reasons he's doing it. Because of what happened to God, the, God and the two angels, or the two angels rather. God was not present. If he had to be, he would have probably pulled a hammer right there. But uh, the two angels in saving Lot's house, we pick it up with then with the two angels having a discussion with Lot because Abraham had asked God to take care of it. Uh, the two angels had already headed there to bring down the destruction. And God gives them this assignment just before the hammer falls on Sodom and Gomorrah. So, chapter 19, verse 12, let's go with it, with a word of wisdom from our Father. And the men, that's to say the angels, said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? Question. That means, do you have any people that are righteous? Son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. That means it's time to move. 13. For we will, or we're about to destroy this place. Because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. You know, there is a day coming before very long that that's going to happen to this earth age again. We know that the spurious Messiah appears first. And then when that seventh trump sounds, nothing violent is going to happen to God's children, the ones he loves, the ones that are true to him. Uh, but woe be to those men um, that are not in good graces with our father. Verse 14. And Lot went out and spake unto his son -in -law, sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, up and get you out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. In other words, it sounded to his sons-in-law like he was talking a bunch of nonsense. Who's going to do what? I don't know, maybe you've tried to plant a seed with somebody and or have mentioned that God's going to come back and shake this earth up and you have some of these non-believers that would think that was nonsense well it's going to happen whether they think it's nonsense or not the hourglass of the final day has already been tipped and the times the sands of time are trickling to the lower quadrant of the hourglass and the hour of temptation is upon us so it's not a good time to be too far away from your father's thoughts and plan, that is to say his word. For certainly as Christ would liken that coming time to the time of Lot, I, I would say that that was a strong hint that perhaps you should determine, I'm not reading into this, that's what it happened for in this, was for your um, example of how it's going to be. You sure don't have to look too far to, to hear the cries or know the cries that should come by simply turning on your boob tube and listening to the evening news. Verse 15. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Now the iniquity 
is the uh, judgment would be uh, uh, probably more liking or punishment certainly the the way they would be uh, judged but it is their sins that brings it to pass make sure you note that verse 16 and while he lingered old Lot kept hesitating the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters the Lord being merciful unto him you better take note of that the Lord being merciful unto him and they brought him forth and set him without the city do you think do you think God Yahweh was this merciful to Lot for his own being because you know Lot was kind of uh, he was a little bit on the flaky side himself and I'm not judging him but anybody that wants to snuggle up to Sodom and Gomorrah that's to say the Sodomites and the Gomorrahites anybody that wants to snuggle up to them and be one of their judges I've, I've got to kind of wonder about but here God I mean even when he's saying you know God usually will say move it Something's going to happen here. And if you hesitate, sorry, you're going to get it. He warned you, wham, it happens. Now, in this case, God is certainly um, being very patient. We'll talk about that a little more as to why that he would be so specially merciful to this one that is all snugly with the Sodomites. Verse 17. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither say, uh, stay thou in all the plain. You get out of the flat. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. I mean, it's going to break loose. Verse 18. I mean, that means head for the high country. What does that suggest? All right. 18. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Now that's beginning to live dangerously there. Verse 19. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy. Boy, had they ever. Which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain lest some evil take me and I die. Now, this has said a whole lot about Lot here. If I go up in those mountains, somebody will kill me. Well, it's obvious he's a city dude. For a man that doesn't know how to survive in the mountains hasn't been around very much. He's just a little city dude. Um, and is not familiar with how to be a man. And, and I, I'm not saying that to insult anyone, but I'm showing you where Lot's desires are. Myself, I love to go to, I'd rather be in the mountains than the city. But, um, it, it, and the reason I say this is understand what kind of city he chooses. Sodom, Gomorrah. His uncle gave him the choice and he chose them. Not only did he choose to live in the lower land rather than to take the high road, he snuggles up to, to Sodom. Verse 20. Behold now, this city is near to flee into, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? Question. And my soul shall live. So, I want to tell you something, friend. You better never hang your soul on a city. I don't care how, what size it is. You better hang it on your father. I'm just showing you what's going through uh, Lot's mind and what he's saying. I, I cannot, it's very difficult unless you understand the reason why that the angels wouldn't say, okay, sucker, stay. You know, but they won't. There's a reason, 21. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also. They, they gave a hint. The two angels did. That I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Not yet. He's going to. 
but he's kind of just nursemaiding a lot along here, this city dude, judge, before it won't take much encouragement for a lot to head for high ground. Verse 22. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither, until you get out of here. I've got to destroy this place and you're holding up the, the whole ball game here. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar, which is to say, a little one. Do you know what its name was before? You read of it back in the 14th chapter, I believe, yes. And, and there it was called Bela. Bela, one of the kings was the king of Bela. And remember what I told you the name meant in Hebrew? Maybe, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, but it means destruction. So the name of the little town he chose was destruction. It's just a little one, all right. It's a good thing they changed the name to Zoar, little one, because Bela would have been very adequate and appropriate for what was about to happen to it anyway. Destruction. Verse 23. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah. Who did this? The Lord did brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now, naturally, a volcano would produce most everything that was here. The order came from heaven. Is that what happened? Well, uh, we know that from effects even to this day, even to this day in this particular locale, it isn't difficult to document that Sodom and Gomorrah existed. 25. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. Now, bear in mind, when God overthrows something, and this kind of takes you back to the overthrow in the first earth age of the whole world. But this is just a city and her little uh, subur suburbs here with Zoar getting a little bit of a reprieve or perhaps we'd better even call it Bela. That was really the name of it until Lot made that comment that uh, its name was destruction. It was doomed from the start because of what the people were doing there. 26. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. In other words, Lot wasn't aware. She was behind Lot and she decided she'd sneak a little peek here. I'm sure that now that Lot's on the road up into the mountains, it's obvious they're not country folk and they're not nature folk. They're city folk. And she's no doubt dreaming back of how good it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe she even liked some of the things that took place there. A lot of people wonder about the pillar of salt. Is that possible? Would God do that? Well, think where you're at, person. You're at the extreme south edge of the Dead Sea. Sodom and Gomorrah rest snuggled up just below the hills or mountains on the west side of the south tip of the Dead Sea. And uh, Zoar is about oh, two-thirds, I'm going by memory now, don't quote me and hold me to exactness on this, about two-thirds across the plain on the south end of the Dead Sea right up to the salt. That's, you, have you ever heard about the Dead Sea, about how salty it is? It actually, the vapors from it, if there's any little brush or anything near it, it's encased in salt. So I have no doubt that when she fell, she was encrusted with salt pretty soon because of the geographical location she was in. And especially, I imagine there was a little more exhalation or humidity because of the humidity of the burning of Sodom and Gomorrah that the, um, that the vapors off of the Dead Sea were probably running a little stronger than they would under normal conditions anyway. 
and she was encrusted and began to look like a salt statue laying there as God left her. There's quite a lesson in that for you, beloved. You that even are fortunate enough that God is showing grace, don't look back too many times. For there will be just that one time that it's one time too many. Just exactly as it was in the case of Lot's wife. So don't, don't think this couldn't happen. God turned her into a pillar of salt. Well, hey, you go lay down there at the end of that and uh, as a dead corpse with nobody to drag you away and see how long it takes before you're encrusted. You know, the remains there. There's no great miracle to that's what I'm saying. The miracle was that God was fed up. And that's what you'd better pay attention to. God, our Father, full of love, does get fed up. Verse 27. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. We're changing subjects a little bit, going to a little different location, but still within sight. 28. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. I mean, God doesn't do something halfway. 29. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. I hope that answered your question of why God was so patient with Lot and why Lot found grace with God when he liked to snuggle up to Sodomites. Well, how could God have mercy on them? God loves his children. God even loved those children that were Sodomites. It's what they were doing that upset him. God loves all of his children. But don't ever forget it. It was the fact that Abraham pleaded for his nephew Lot before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember he started out with the 50? I suppose that was the chapter just before this, was it not? And yes it was. It was, God, it was Abraham's intercession. So if you're one of these that thinks intercession doesn't work and if you ever need an example of it think about Lot and think about the filthy lousy company that he kept and that God could still have mercy on him even when he whines and snivels about oh, I don't really want to go there I mean, I mean when God tells you go there and live I mean, you'd better take God's word for it. But Abraham, his faith never wavered. And God surely loved him that he would pick that one man that through his seed would come the Son of God, which is to say Jesus Christ. So if you ever have any doubt that if you really love the Lord and are true to him as best as you can be. If you think that an intercessor or prayer by you to our Father won't help someone that's a little bit iffy, then you're mistaken. Always remember, if that be your, if that be your like, then go see what God did for Lot, and Lot being, to me, a weakling. I don't, you know, if somebody is weak because of a handicap or something like that, I will fight for them. I will carry them. I will do whatever I can to help them. But somebody that's able-bodied and weak, I really don't have that much use for. Because it is a thing of the mind, and the mind only. Now understand what I said. I don't want to get any letters about what about the handicapped or what about the frail people that aren't uh, six foot four and weigh 250 pounds. Well, 
what wherever wherever the balance set let it let it level for itself you know I've known uh, statute really doesn't have that much to do with it I've known some very small men that were terrible war awful awesome warriors but they had the courage can do type people that for God they would give their lives and um, here we had one that just, I mean, he just kind of uh, drug his feet and pulled back all the way as they're pulling him. Save your life, save your life. And he said, I'll die up on that mountain. And they're pulling him along. And he knows that he's found grace. And he, he even used that. Now that I have mercy, let me go to this little one. Little town. He knew for some way he'd got an in with the angels because, he, I mean, here's a large city, two of them, that's going to be destroyed, and he and his daughter and his wife have found mercy. So he kind of took advantage of it, I feel. And, and now am I down, downgrading Lot? No, Lot overall was a pretty good old boy. But he had these, one, these traits that I know God had to decide I'm going to make an example here of intercessory prayer of someone interceding for someone because in my mind there could not be a better case old lot you might say well you're being hard on him well what do you think here Abraham shows you hey our flocks are too big to go together anymore you're gonna to have to go one way and me another and nephew, I'm going to let you choose the way. And Lot looks over down there, and boy, there is a nice plain. It's lush. Whoo, lots of grass. It's no doubt. Hey, I'm pulling that and let old Lunk take off out here to the wild country. I mean, you know, is that really, is that the type of guy you'd like to, you know, be around? His old uncle get, had pretty well provided everything he had and advice and everything else, and he did that to his uncle. And yet his uncle interceded. And this isn't the first time old Unc had to stand up for Lot. You'll remember already that back in the chapter I mentioned, I think it's 14, where those five kings made war against Sodom and Gomorrah. And they took old Lot and his whole family captive. The Babylonians did and was drug them up. And Abraham, because of his dear nephew, took 318 men and went up and whipped the whole bunch and brought Lot back. Lot was always kind of a burr under his saddle, if you ask me. And I know I'm being a little hard on him, but I think he deserves it. And I do that to make the point, to make the point that if he hadn't have been so snugly with Sodom and Gomorrah, God would have blessed him where he wouldn't have been taken captive in the first place. That bothers me a little bit. But it is all to make the point, and the point is I cannot believe that God wanted to have that much patience with Lot. And God admits it right here. God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. It was because of Abraham that God allowed Lot those privileges to prove a point to you, beloved, an example, because Christ brings these points out even in the New Testament. Intercessory prayer works if you're beloved of God. Well, how do I know I could make an intercessory prayer? Be beloved of God. Well, how do I do that? Let him know you love him and that you're a can-do type person for the Lord. I think we're on verse 30. Is that right? I, I did not digress. I don't feel. I think that was necessary. Verse 30. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar. He should have. And he dwelt in, the, dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. 31. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Verse 32. Come and let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. 33. And they made their father drink wine that night and the firstborn went in 
and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. One of the oldest, oldest sets of manuscripts uh, indicate that this would be that he was so drunk he didn't know what he was doing. All right, so let's, let's just say it like it is. Verse 34, And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. Verse 35, And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. He perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Verse 36, Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Now, you know, down through the years, scholars I respect have come up with various reasons for this. That the two girls had kind of grown up right there in Sodom and Gomorrah and their um, their morals and their moral training wasn't really all that much and that it was what they had witnessed in Sodom and Gomorrah that made them think very little of this incestuous act and therefore they simply were just wicked girls and um, and uh, that it was probably lust that caused it. Well, I, I really do not agree with that. I do not, um, I think, as it pretty well is based, you know, not everybody, if you've never been in combat or war or a place where a very traumatic event takes place. If you haven't seen people dying by the by the hundreds in a traumatic thing, I mean, I mean, if think think about it, how, how would you know uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed? And I'm sure when those girls said, I, I don't think they thought that anyone else was left alive on Earth. Trauma causes people to do strange things. So, I kind of would rather, in my own mind, having been in a combat a few times, and knowing how people, how people can think under, um, tr under traumatic pressure, especially the aftermath of trauma. Uh, can cause people to think uh, it won't it won't turn them to lust, but it can cause them to do uh, things a little above and beyond and on the call of duty to try to get things back to norm. So, in my own mind, in my own opinion, I believe that these two girls thought this is the only way mankind could continue on. And I think that is the reason that it was done, not just because they were. Now, many people think that that uh, these girls were um, were um, had husbands back there, you know, because it says your son-in-laws. I don't think so, because do, do you remember back when the perverts came to the door? He says, "I have two daughters that have never been with man." I think these were two single girls. I don't think they'd ever been with man. I think the other daughters chose to stay in Sodom and Gomorrah with their husbands. It is sad, and many might say, well, boy, you're really jumping to a lot of... Con no, I'm not. That's common sense. That's what... A lot wouldn't lie about the two girls, all right? So these were two younger girls that were at home. And well, it's a firstborn, yeah? Of the two, she was. That's no big deal. So, I'm not so sure. In other words, I'm not gonna hang a heavy trip on these two girls. Because I, I know what a traumatic situation their own mother struck down by God. And they're all they are in a cave and everything below in that valley is dead. They think. I really believe they felt that, and it was, 
I, I think that that firstborn was reasoning uh, to her logically, but again, under a traumatic stress, it does strange things to people. It truly does. Um, many of you that have experienced what I'm talking about, you'll know exactly what I mean. So, not that it makes any big difference, really. It happened. It was incest. They both conceived. And um, so, uh, and they will continue their father's seed, and it will have an effect on Israel. It certainly will. So let's continue on. Next verse, please. Verse 37. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. It means, Moab in the Hebrew tongue means of his father. All right, and he was. And the same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. And so it is. There are many things and uh, things that were said against the male Moabites, but it does not apply to the female Moabites. Ruth was a Moabite. But the, what the men did did not apply to the women. So don't ever get nervous about the genealogy. Verse 38. And the younger, she also bare a son and called his name Ben-Ami. The name, the same, is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. Uh, son of my people, Ben, uh, Ben is son, and Ami is people. Uh, of their own people, why? Because it was the girl's father that impregnated them. So here we have it. Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. Lot and the two daughters brought out and a people brought forth that will certainly affect um, the rest of Abraham's family as they continue on down through the years. And it may sound as though I was being easy on the daughters and hard on Lot. Well, if so, then it's for a good reason. Intercessory prayer works. If. If. You are in the grace of God. God is patient, and um, there are, it's not, that I'm not trying to say that intercessory prayer works every time, because God sometimes is dealing with people, and they must go all the way to the bottom before they can learn that people are stubborn. I mean, look at yourself. There are things, if you want something real bad, it's really tough to teach you a lesson that maybe that's not good for you. Well, God does that in certain cases, but there are cases that he will instantly change the situation. I like to use intercessory prayer most often to change minds because you can counsel someone that something is wrong and they can't see it. And in their mind, they're going to be uh, bent for leather to do what they want to do but God can change their minds just bang just like that and they're a different person that's a good way to utilize intercessory prayer okay well we'll stop there for this lecture I think it was a I think it's a fantastic chapter that 19th chapter a lot of lessons to be learned there that are very valuable for this generation of the fig tree, which is the last generation of this particular dispensation of time. How can you say that? I didn't say it, Christ did, Matthew 13. When you see the parable of the fig tree come to pass, this generation shall not pass until all prophecy has been fulfilled. We're in it. It began in 1948. Is that a setting a date? No. It happened. It's history now. And boy, is prophecy popping like labor pains for the birth of a new age, and it's coming. So don't forget this chapter. It's very important to you. Think about it, and you'll understand. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The